everybody, welcome to the Expresso, your daily shot of Chinese words with Catherine Xia. I'm Catherine Xia. 大家好，欢迎来到我的频道自 Expresso。在这个频道呢，我们看字和词之间的关系。I'm super excited because this is the first time I'm going to create a new playlist called 名师讲坛 Ask the Experts. So I'm going to invite you know experts, Chinese teachers in the field who has unique research or insights. In terms of teaching Chinese as a foreign language, today I'm super excited to have my colleague as well as a good friend, Dr. Li Jing Shi Shi Li Jing 博士参与我们今天的访谈 So she's the first one on my interview list. Li Jing, would you like to say hi to the friends of the Expresso? Hello, everyone.、Um, dear viewers, I'm very excited, but also a little bit nervous. <laughs> It's a great honor to be invited by Dr. Xiang to talk about my research. I hope what I'm going to say today will be useful for your learning as well. Definitely, thank you, Li Jing. So I would first like to introduce her. She is currently the Assistant Language Coordinator at LSE London School of Economics and Political Science, and she teaches a range of Mandarin courses there. And she was awarded the Teaching Excellence Awards in 2013 and 2017. And she is also the chair of British Chinese Language Teaching Society. Which is the Higher Education Association focused on Chinese language education. But before joining LSE, she also taught English as a foreign language in the UK, as well as contributed to UK's first distance learning Chinese course at the Open University. So she holds a PhD in Technology Enhanced Language Learning and MED in Educational Technology and TESOL. Her main research area, including Dynamic assessment, eye tracking, online language teaching, and intercultural communication. So she has published a wide range of articles in this area. And today, very pleased and very excited to enable everybody to hear more about her recent research. And later, of course, I will ask her about her own advice to our language learners. So Li Jing, I know recently you've been doing extensive research on eye tracking. You know, so you've been published a few、uh, interesting articles in journals. For example, in 2018, the eye tracking technology and its implication in Chinese teaching and learning by the Journal of Technology and Chinese Language Teaching. It would be great if you can share more about your research and your key findings. Shall I pass it over to you to tell us a little bit more? Okay. Okay. Thank you.、Um, yes, as Catherine、uh, said, I have been doing eye tracking for about、uh, for five years. I started with Dr. Ushi Stickler at the Open University in 2015, looking at online、um, learning experience. Basically, actually, we will look at distance learning students how they read and interact during online sessions. So at that time, we doesn't imagine that nearly all the teachers. Have to do online teaching due to COVID. So,、okay. yes, <laughs> so you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a kind of、uh, very interesting、um, way to looking at our research. So, just that's the、uh, the first thing I want to say. Basically, research started you know long time ago. Although while we are doing research, we don't know what is the implication going to be. But it's nice to see you know the relevance. Uh, the relevance of our research nowadays, and after that research, we conducted uh, uh, eye tracking research on、um, teachers. Actually, we compare how teach how teachers teach、uh, during online sessions.、Um, as the evidence grow,、uh, mm -hmm. I suddenly realize why not do the same thing with my current students who are studying in LSC. So today I'm going to mainly share this piece of research、uh, about uh, you know、uh, university students, how these students learning characters through the lens of eye tracking. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, just uh,、um, bring up my PowerPoint. So.、Um, I was mainly interested in how students develop their learning、uh, reading strategies in learning Chinese as a foreign language. So I'm going to go very quickly with these、uh, points, but、uh, more or less is a standard research、uh, format.、Um, so the main research questions is: What do these 
uh, CFL learners focus on during their reading process at why. Right, and then what uh, strategy do they apply during their reading? And then what kind of strategy do they employ outside the classroom? So in order to answer these questions, I need to use not only one research method, but the two. One is eye tracking. So I need to use the eye tracker to track and record their eye movement during reading. But at the same time, not at the same time, and then follow the by student recall interviews. So basically I replay the recording of eye tracking and asking them questions. In this way, uh, we can discuss, first of all, you know, why they do this. Secondly, we can and prompt the learners to think about their behaviors. So um, the difference of um, our research, uh, eye tracking research, um, from the conventional eye tracking research is here. Basically, not just use, I may mean, I say use, or collect information from learners, but we want to giving something back to the participants while they are participating in our research. Yeah, okay, um, so that's the main methodological uh, considerations here. And then as I teach a wide range of uh, students and the co uh, courses, so this gives me uh, advantage of uh, having different kinds of participants here. So I look at real beginners like A1, just starting learning Chinese for several weeks. Uh, I had uh, three students and then I also had the mastery students. So these are serious, the highest level degree students studying in LSC and also three students. Um, so they were invited to uh, com like a complete online uh, reading while the eye track, their eye movement was tracked and then ask them questions. So here are some like uh, snapshots of my results. As you can see here, the, the green, the red, you know, what do they present? Uh, so the red represents the longer time uh, they focus on certain area for the information on the screen while they're reading. So the red the area is the longer a learner, a viewer is looking at something. So we can see Simon or Simon, let's put it this way, Simon. So he may majority looking at uh, pinyin and then Bide, he is consciously, more, con more consciously looking at the characters. So as we can see, as early as like a learning character, a learning Chinese just into few weeks, the learner's difference already emerged. Okay, and then, uh, we can also see here is the how their eye moves. So this is called a gaze plot. So the gaze moves, all right? So they are numbered. And then we can see uh, for weaker re readers, they spend more time, they need to focus on more information, literally word by word, character by character, or pinging by character, pinging. But uh, uh, more front learners, they can actually jump. They can be more selective in terms of taking the information. So you can see Bida's picture, the gaze plot is less uh, dense than Simon's. All right. And then it's also very interesting to look at the difference at a mastery level. So as I said earlier, so two learners, actually they are non-native speakers. They came from Europe. They can already speak more than three languages. So Mandarin Chinese is probably the fourth, the fourth or fifth language they're learning. And then uh, I had uh, actually a heritage students from Hong Kong, right? Uh, although they are in the same class, uh, by our assessment, they are fit for this course. But you can see in terms of reading, the, the difference is huge. Yeah, the difference is huge. So uh, non-native speakers need to put in a lot more effort where they are reading, but uh, heritage learners can be more selective. Uh, she is not reading linearly. She can jump around very quickly answer the questions. Um, yeah, so here as well, you know, this, uh, this picture shows the lenient uh, pattern of non-native uh, speakers, but uh, this kind of more relaxed, more selective way of reading of uh, heritage students. 
And yeah, the next bit is also very enjoyable. So after recording, I talk to students, asking them questions. Uh, how do you feel about your own reading um, behavior, method, strategy? How do you feel about learning Chinese? So um, here we can see different things, yeah? So basically, Peter, he made conscious decision. He want to focus on characters. All right, so only look at the character when he is not sure. And then uh, Laura, basically, she's not, she's just starting. So she doesn't know where to look at. So she needs something to hang on to when she started learning characters. So she felt like a, a stroke order can be the first thing to be understood and then to carry on to decipher the characters. Yeah. Um, and then here, uh, it's about uh, uh, Ji Mu. So he is a much higher level learner, but he focuses a lot on characters as well. Uh, and then they are not, these two learners, they are not against writing characters repetitively. So they enjoy doing it actually. So that is very interesting. So the attitudes of towards characters uh, can be very important and then can decide how they learn characters, how they approach reading. Uh, that's the one uh, area of uh, findings. Uh, the second one is uh, we see more uh, kind of diversity at a higher level. So like uh, heritage students, Le here, uh, she clearly says, you know, state that I use context to, to guess the meaning of the words I don't know. I don't read word by word, you know, as you can recall, she reads much more quickly, more selectively, her eye movement jumps up and down. And then, but uh, for Qi, uh, despite her very high level of Chinese uh, fluency, um, she still needs to read the whole text and then read the question and return to the text. So it takes much longer for non-native speakers. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this, you know, when we look at how they develop or practice reading or practice uh, Chinese language outside the classroom, we also see the difference, you know. One group, we can, I kind of call it a more relaxed, more messy method, and the other group is more kind of more tidy, uh, studious method. So for example, Jim is very interesting, you know. He can speak four or five languages already, but he's super organized, right? So this kind of preference actually influenced his way of learning characters, or learning Chinese at the moment. So you can, he can say, when I came across a word I don't know, I will write down every single thing with pinyin, its English meaning, and even a simple sentence. So he's learning word by word. While Qi, uh, so, uh, from from Scandinavia, she's more relaxed. You know, I I re basically I read a Harry Potter in Chinese. You know, I watch television. I talk to people. Uh, I'm more kind of in, enjoy. I enjoy more this free conversation, the fluence. I don't really care about that single characters. So and then uh, in their learning in the classroom, I can see clear difference as well. Um, so I have to say the students who enjoy this more extensive, uh, more relaxed learning method seem to develop a fluency much better than the one who could focus on discrete single characters at a mastery level. All right. Um, okay. So that's the uh, their day behaviors, you know, daily learning behaviors, <laughs> difference uh, reflected or reviewed from the stimulator recall. All right. Um, so just to, because of today's time, just need to quickly round up. So I think from this, based on these limited uh, findings, I can see the students learn, use a range of reading strategies, but they are influenced by personality, what kind of people they are. You know, some people just like tidiness, some people just like very relaxed, okay? And the previous learning experience, I think the previous learning experience plays a very important role. As I said, they already learned the three, four language before. And then their learning behavior in the university can be kind of heavily influenced by their learning behavior in their secondary school. 
for example, one student said, you know, that's the way my teacher told me to do. So I feel comfortable. I always get very high marks, so I keep doing it, right? And then also the reading habits in other languages. So, so the, the way they learn English influence the way they learn Chinese reading. Yeah, um, but I think as a learner progress, the top-down strategy is very important. So basically not just look at the single characters, but to try to look at the context to guess the meaning, but also kind of more interactive, uh, more intensive additional reading outside of the classroom, right? Um, repetitively writing characters definitely helps, especially at the early stage. Okay, it helps you to understand the, the, the structure, the meaning behind the characters. But, you know, as, the, as you progress, as the language becomes more and more complex, so it, the, 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 the effect may kind of decrease. So you need to think to put in new methods to, to complement, yeah? Um, I think the beginners need the most support when they transit from pinyin to characters, like how to get rid of this walking stick to walk by them by yourself independently, right? Um, and then, but for the higher level students, you know, it's basically uh, they need to focus on idioms, terminologies, and also uh, translation skills, you know, be more aware of the language difference between Chinese and their first language. Um, so uh, to conclude, I think uh, reading is really, really interesting. Reading is really, really fascinating as well. Uh, so to from, to be a fluent reader, you need to read rapidly, purposefully, interactively, understand, and then be flexible as well. And at the same time, be aware, you know, the development of skills and uh, is really gradually, not uh, something you can achieve within three years of time or, or three terms or three books or something like that, yeah? Um, so for our teachers, you know, I'm always thinking about teachers, uh, we need to have more dedicated teaching on reading strategies, including how to uh, integrate uh, the character knowledge, like Catherine's doing, you know, telling a lot about the story behind the characters, yeah, and then also the strategy need to be uh, stage appropriate, you know, for beginners, the, the something works for the beginners, not necessarily work for the higher level learners. And also very, very important is to be reflective. I think the, the purpose or the strong point of, of our research method is to encourage reflection. So by talking, by looking at your own behavior recorded by eye tracker, you have idea, you know, you, you sometimes what you're thinking you're doing is actually different from what you are actually doing. So eye tracking actually provides this window into this unknown area. So I would encourage more students to be more reflective. Okay, I think that's more or less uh, <laughs> my short uh, summary of the current study. Thank you so much, Li Jing. Fascinating. Um, Yes, so I, I have lots of questions. <laughs> and uh, so first I just thought, cause you know, when you show the, um, the eye gazing, right? So the, the, the different um, heat map. So I, I just wondered for people who don't anything about eye tracking at all, can you just tell us a little bit more how, how you actually use the eye track technology? How does that involve, what does that involve? And okay, okay, yes, yes. Yeah, it's just people might think, oh, how do you actually track eyes? What does that mean? Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Okay, all right, yeah. Of course, I, I try to find these little, uh, these slides so you can see, all right? So, um, this is the basically the current technology, the latest technology. It's basically a laptop with an eye tracker as a portable eye tracker. You can stick to the computer. Then uh, by, by after collaboration, then it will start to record the eye movement uh, uh, patterns, you know, time, the way how you move your eyes. And the it came with a software, so actually automatically can generate heat maps, gaze plot, and then it can produce numerical data as well, you know, how long you look at certain areas. So that's the simplest way to put it at the, at the moment. But of course, in the before, it's quite a painful 
right? You 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 have like a headgear to wear it, <laughs> like a torture, really. But nowadays, uh, more and more people using computer software. Sometimes it's like a standalone machine, yeah. But it also depends on how detailed you want your eye tracking to be. So for my study, I'm not that interested in individual characters or like a conventional reading uh, research in eye tracking. I'm more interested in the overall picture so the technical the resolution uh you know is not that highly uh required so that's how we conduct uh, eye tracking but uh, the limitation is only one pair of eyes can be tracked at one okay. time by one machine that's okay. the limitation so it's a time it's time consuming yeah right, right. Thank you for explaining that because I think it's really interesting for people who don't know anything about eye tracking as a research tool. Um, the other thing is just about a few points that I pick up from your talk. One is the strategy. So it's very clear through your research, different learners use different strategies. Yeah. And it seems that people who have not had that habit of like different from heritage students, for example, mm -hmm. like what you said, strike me most is they have to go one by one kind yeah. of linear approach so how do we help our you know non-native speaker to learn that kind of more flexible like they know they have that sense of where to look in order to get to the main meaning of the text quicker do you have any suggestion on that like how do we as teachers you know or even just to the you know, audience that students of the Expresso, how can they change that kind of behavior? Yeah, I think the first thing uh, is what we can do is show them these data, you know, to be aware, actually, they are reading like that character <laughs> by character. And then secondly, I think they need to be um, kind of, how do I put it, like uh, psychologically, uh, be, more mm -hmm. uh, be more relaxed, maybe due to this, uh, research nature, you know, they thinking they are doing a test, they have to do it, you know, they have to answer these questions. So maybe if I change the uh, research method, say just read this and uh, then sum, sum up, you know, then maybe the pattern is going to be quite different. But I also think, you know, uh, we need to encourage students to read more, more quickly. Mm. But that is not easy, you know, especially in universities, as all the students are, are care about results, you know, exams. Mm. Uh, so it's difficult. But I will encourage them like uh, what uh, um, English learners do. They, they have graded reading material. So they do, they like uh, kids in the school, they, every day they have to read a short book of English, but uh, maybe that's uh, what uh, learners need to do, like every day read a short piece of Chinese uh, text, okay. and then gradually they can quickly uh, get the idea. Mm, but also I think for our teachers, we can teach them some uh, reading strategies, say to answer this type of question, uh, you can look at the concept sentence in the paragraph, uh, to read this, you need to quickly locate the information, so something like uh, a lot of uh, research have been done in English reading strategy, you know, that's something we can make reference to. Okay, great. Um, the other thing I picked up, I think is quite important, is about the context, right? So how learners can use context to be able to comprehend better. Um, do you have anything to add to that? So, you know, you mentioned it's actually from students' own reflection, right? So they say, the reason I don't have to read absolutely everything is I understand where I can identify the context that can help me. So how how did they manage to do that and how can we teach other learners to do that and mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah it's it's a context is really interesting you know because context can involve like knowledge based sometimes you know if you ask me to read something medicine i won't be able to read it very mm -hmm. fast but uh, for a non native speaker because if it's a medical school student, probably can read faster than me. So that's one layer of context. The other layer is really, you know, when you look at a sentence, whether do you know the meaning of the first part or do you know the meaning after that character? So more or less you can figure it out. So for our teacher, you know, just for language teachers is really um, tell uh, teach students 
you know, uh, the sentence patterns, you know, key sentence structures. If you see yi dan, and then probably there is a jiu. So if you are familiar with that, you know that is a kind of conditional there. And then if uh, we teach them certain sentence structure, you know, we know, uh, like for example, uh, the is always before the noun, the most important noun, then they don't, if they don't know the thing before the, all this modifier, they can ignore it for the time being. Yeah, mm -hmm. just focus on the most important noun, most important verb, so they can quickly figure out the meaning more or less. But also, yes, come back is the feeling comfortable. I think it's very important when you read in a foreign language, you need to feel comfortable of not knowing it. So just like, oh, it's fine, you know, I just read it through, I grant it, all oh, this, I, I know 40% of that, that's great, you know, I don't need to be 100% all the time. I think this kind of mentality is really important, especially for university students, you know, they, they care so much about being 100%, being first class. Sometimes it's actually adding to their stress rather than adding to their progress. Yeah, I think like you say, I think one of the things I do agree that we can learn quite a lot from uh, English as a you know foreign language, there's a lot of research done on that. But one of the differences is that because Chinese language, the way we structure our sentence, there's no break in between yeah. words, while English there's spacing, right? So it's easier relatively for learners to understand how the words break down. While in Chinese, we don't use in spacing at all. So in a way, it, it, it has that more mental demand on the student to understand where the words go. So yeah. in a way, you know, I was thinking through the espresso, if you kind of know the building block, yeah. you probably have a little bit better mm. sort of uh, strategy to identify how the words go together. But it is, I think it's a unique challenge when it comes to Chinese. Yes, yes. Actually, there was a study about, you know, whether uh, eye tracking research actually about insert, whether to insert the space between characters right. or not, really. Yeah, it is a very unique thing. I think that is, uh, again, to do with input, isn't it? And also, again, to do with how you're building up uh, uh, the, the words. So, for example, if learners know uh, how Chinese words are built up, like you said, like building blocks, like Legos, you know, I always say like Legos, so they will read much faster. The, the more you, but again, it's the more you read, the more you know about this language, mm -hmm. the faster you are going to read. Mm -hmm. And the final uh, point from your talk, um, which I found really interesting and important is when you talk about beginner level, right? When they have to go through that transition, Mm. from pinyin to captus. So, you know, in our field, we have a lot of debate. Some university will introduce pinyin first, some, some university introduce character first, some university introduce pinyin character at the same time. So put that aside, let's say we introduce pinyin first and there will be a point that they have to learn Chinese characters if they want to really get to know much deeper about Chinese language and culture. So what's your advice or suggestion in terms of how we can help students to, to successfully and less painfully go through that transition. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's like a, this $1 million question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think, but we, uh, I against, I against this negative view towards pinyin. A lot of people thinking, oh, no, 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 no pain, you know, should get rid of pain as soon as qu quickly, as soon as possible. No, I against that because from our data, it's very clear. A student not just rely on pain to, to, to make a comprehension, you know, they, yeah, but they also use pain to confirm, to, to build up confidence. So let me talk a bit more about that. So we know uh, from very beginning for non-native speakers, Westerners, they need to have pinyin to make the link between sound and the meaning. So mm -hmm. when they hear pinguo, they first say pinguo and then they make apple, they make the connection. So th this, this is essential. Otherwise they are not going to learn, you know, they, they, they are going to take much longer to learn Chinese, let's put it that way. And then secondly, you know, in the research we found that even it's a very confident beginners. When they read, if pin is there, they will use it. It's to confirm whether their comprehension is right or not. 
So it's it's like additional additional kind of safety net for them feeling. Ah, yes, I'm doing right. I'm doing right. So lots of learn some learners in our research shows they read the character, they answer the question, then they go back to the tipping transcript to confirm. So I think in this way, it's it's a learning. You know, we can't just disregard that. And um, yeah, but uh, I think uh, it is next step. So how to move on to the to the character. I think that actually moving on to the character can be uh, separate from learning pinyin, can be separate mm -hmm. to discuss the pinyin. We can have the pinyin there, but at the same time, we, we draw students' attention to the character, you know, how characters are formed, the head components, like, and like uh, Laura, you know, my research said that she found that, you know, we first need to know, know these uh, strokes, you know, Chinese strokes. So the strokes we probably can say, see it in this way, they are like uh, Chinese alphabets, you know. Uh, in English, we have 26 letters, but in Chinese, we have 30 basic strokes or eight basic strokes. So you just need to them and then combine them together. So we need to be, we can be more playful about that as well. Um, I think it. The, the learning of characters, actually, why it's difficult, I think it's because we ask students to write it. If we only ask students to recognize it, I don't think that's that very difficult. Actually, it can be very helpful because pinyin causes so much confusion, you know? There are 50 different characters for one pinyin E, you know, can be one and can be doctor can be close. So actually they are very willing to go into the world of characters, but just when they have to handwrite it, then it takes much, much more longer. So I'm kind of uh, throughout this question here. Do we really need learners to write characters nowadays? Do we really need to test them of writing characters correctly nowadays? Yeah. So that's uh, something for everyone in the field to discuss, really. Great, great. Finally, most important question for the audience and the friends of the Expresso. So if you were going to give three top tips for learning Chinese, what would be your three tips to all the Mandarin Chinese learners out there? Okay, first of all, enjoy learning it. Just don't just look at how many marks you get, okay? So enjoy learning it, uh, enjoy the learning process. Uh, like uh, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not recognize things. That's just a part of learning process. The second thing is you need to be aware like uh, skills don't develop at the same speed. So you may be ahead in speaking and listening, but uh, maybe lag like behind in reading and writing. But it's kind of a cycle. You need to give that uh, time to develop gradually. In terms of learning character, particularly, I think it is interesting. Um, it is quite important to, like I said, look at uh, strokes as alphabets. Look at uh, word, individual words like Legos, uh, to learn the head components that will improve your. Re uh, character knowledge very fast and also to learn some basic word formation knowledge like uh, if we you know uh, nai, new nai, then you ha can have lots of words at the same time if you knew dian, dian nao, then you can have dian deng, dian, dian shi, uh, dian, dian che, whatever you can have lots so play with it me be more playful uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, watch lots of additional uh, materials, use the language, I think, you know, if you learn the character, you write it, you, you draw it, you put it uh, somewhere, you know, you talk about it, and then uh, imagine things, or maybe imagine a story out of the characters. So I think that probably is some advice I can give to learners, yeah. Great, great. Thank you, Li Jing. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed your research. I hope you all the best with the research. And next time, maybe we're going to have you back and tell us more about the latest findings. And uh, thanks, everybody, for staying with us today. And I hope you really like the content today. It's a very different way of hopefully open your eyes to the world of Chinese language and Chinese learning. So see you next time. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye. Bye.